afternoon to um, everyone and uh, welcome to this uh, last session uh, of the workshop on quantum gravity field theory and uh, gravity. Uh, the first speaker of this uh, session is uh, Francesco Topan, uh, who speaks from uh, CBPF uh, Rio de Janeiro. So, uh, and he will talk about the signatures of uh, uh, Z2 times uh, Z2 graded physics. Uh, Francesco, you can uh, now start whenever you're ready. Okay, thanks a lot, uh, the organizer, for the invitation to be in Corfu. It was it's always a pleasure to be there. Unfortunately, this time only virtually, and I hope. Uh, next time in future uh, to be again in Corfu, uh, presentially. I hope you can see, I share my screen. Now I go into the, uh, just a moment, uh, into the full screen. Hope there is no problem. Anyway, so I will talk about uh, signature of Z2, Z2 graded physics. Hope everything uh, can see, even my pointer. And this, in fact, is uh, based on a set of very recent papers. You see uh, five papers here uh, with the collaboration with uh, uh, Jana Kuznetsova from Brazil and Naruhiko Haizawa from uh, Japan. And uh, this is the list of papers. But uh, mostly I will focus, and they're all very recent, and mostly I will focus, stress these two uh, result. The first one, uh, there are two papers that appeared in the uh, few last few months in the Journal of Physics A. The first one is uh, that uh, Z2, Z2 graded paraparticles are theoretically observable. And the second one concerns a fundamental ambiguity in quantization because uh, a single particle quantum Hamiltonian can produce inequivalent multiparticle sectors induced by different gradings. The results are related, and I will explain uh, uh, all of them in this, in, this, in this talk. So there are three main topics uh, in my presentation. Uh, the first one is, uh, I remember something about uh, uh, the construction was uh, uh, introduced in 1970, 1978 by Rittenberg and Weiler, the so-called Z2-Z2 graded algebras and superalgebras also named as color algebras because of the attempted application to quarks. Uh, as I said, I will discuss uh, inequivalent multiparticle quantizations induced by different gradings, and then the theoretical observational consequence of this structure. I use a framework which I can phrase as uh, to be a, a first quantizations of braided theory. And the framework is encountered in the 1995 book of Majid. And in, my, uh, in this application, it is based on graded Hopf algebras, universal enveloping algebra of a graded algebra, and also with a braided tensor product. So this is the framework that I'm using. Before entering, I just want to mention the motivation. And the motivation came from these two types of constructions that were introduced uh, by Rittenberg and Weiler, superalgebras and, and algebras. I will point out also the difference uh, between the two. The two, the two is uh, just the simplest example of the two n graded uh, structure. So I give you uh, first a timeline of superalgebras in particle physics. In 90s, 1967, there was the famous coleman mandula novo theorem that uh, didn't display any z 2 grade structure. And it was superseded when the supersymmetry was uh, discovered and employed by physicists uh, by the classification of Hag, Wopushansky, and Sonius uh, of the super Poincare algebras based on point particle supersymmetry. This is not the end of the story because uh, in 1982, uh, Dauri and Frey, they introduced the concept of saturated supersymmetries, extended supersymmetries, which uh, take into account the tensorial central charges. Uh, and then this kind of uh, structures uh, is uh, presented, uh, is applied in the string theory because they describe extended objects. And particularly in every dimension, you have the famous M algebra related with that. There is a side story which is not widely known. And in 78, Rittemer and Weiler introduced these Z2Z2 graded superalgebras. So this kind of structure 
you see, they have been investigated by physicists. In the 80s, they uh, received attention to some possible application. And I can mention, you see, these uh, several names like uh, Yukierski, Misha Vasiliev, uh, Tolstoy, Jarvis, Young, Weibur, Zeltukin, Will Storo, and so on and so on. However, this structure was not uh, systematically investigated. What are the consequences of this theory? Mathematicians started to investigate. Scheunert, who also worked in collaboration with, uh, with Rittenberg, so he had uh, this mathematical framework in 78, 79. And since then, mathematicians work on this structure. You have to wait until 2000 uh, to, in, to start investigating the connection with parastatistics. And there were two papers by uh, two Chinese, Yang and Jing, and then followed later by paper by Kanakoglu and Daskalo Yannis, and then Tolstoy, Stoloy, Stoilova, and Van der Jok. This was topics mostly for mathematicians at this point. But the community of mathematical physicists started getting a new attention when uh, we realized in, uh, with the, these uh, Brazilian-Japanese collaboration, so it was uh, five years ago, that in fact, the rhythm regular the two that degraded the superalgebras act as dynamical symmetries of some well-known systems. The systems in this case is the system of uh, levi leblon spinors, which are non-relativistic uh, uh, spinors uh, described, uh, and these act as dynamical symmetries of the partial differential equation. So this prompted some renewed attention in the community of mathematical physicists, and there is a new current wave of investigation in this direction. And this, you can see the name of people that uh, increasing are working on this. Apart of our collaboration, there are Bruce and Dupli, Grabowski, Ponsin, uh, and so on and so on. The first one, I want to point out what does it mean and also why they have been neglected. So, what is the difference, first of all, between the two the two graded superalgebras and the two the two graded algebras? Is in the way in which you uh, assign commutator and anti-commutator among particles. And there are these kind of possibilities. Let us go back to ordinary physics. In ordinary physics, you can uh, say that uh, ordinary particles uh, are described by one bit of information. You can say that the bosons are zero, fermions are one, and uh, the encoded properties like a commutator between bosons and fermions, anti-commutators among fermions, uh, can be described by a mode two arithmetic, by one bit of information, zero and one. And the anti-commutator of Fermius encode the property of the Pauli exclusion principle. So what are uh, the two the two graded superalgebras and algebras? Are a two-bit extension of this construction. You can accommodate the graded particle in two bits of information. And there are two cases. In the superalgebra case, you can have uh, ordinary bosons. You, have, you can have parafermions of type 1, 0, and 0, 1. They anti-commute among them with themselves, but uh, contrary to ordinary fermions, they commute. And then you have another structure, which is the exotic bosons. And everything, the consistency of this construction is encoded in this table. So what are these the two, the two grady superalgebras? A real extension of ordinary physics. Why? Simply take uh, this two-bit construction and accommodate uh, ordinary bosons in the 0, 0 sector, ordinary fermions in the 1, 0 sector, and left, leave empty the other two sectors, you recover the standard superalgebra, the standard way of encoding ordinary particles. So this means that uh, the Z2, Z2 graded superalgebras are real extension of ordinary physics. First consideration. The second consideration is that uh, there exists an alternative grading where you do not have any fermions or parafermions. You have only bosons and parabosons. 
and the parabosons, uh, they all commute among themselves, I mean, on the, on the same structure, so that you don't have any Fermi exclusion principle for them, but they have this kind of property that anti-commute uh, if you take uh, parabosons of different sectors. And you have three different sectors that are all on equal footing. I also mentioned that this structure was neglected. So if you uh, investigate the recent uh, physics literature, they don't even bother to mention about this structure that was introduced uh, in the original work by Rittenberg and Weiler, because of course, most of the focus is uh, in is extension of supersymmetry, superalgebra, where you have fermions. But anyway, this structure is there and there are some consequences also on this structure. So I will work on with both the structure at hand. And again, you have some properties for this kind of two-bit physics implied by algebra, which leads to parabosons. So I mentioned that this kind of theory are an extension of ordinary physics. So the fundamental question is why they haven't been investigated as they deserved. And there is an important question which is lingering around. And the important question is the following. So even if we suppose that we have this description of two-bit physics in the Rittenberg-Weiler setting, the question is, can we observe the color of this particle? Or stated otherwise, is this structure sufficient to describe new physics or in some way, you can always realize some quantum measurement that can be mimicked by the ordinary black and white pictures of composite bosons and fermions. A positive answer to this question would prove that the Rittenberg-Weiler algebra and the superalgebra can play indeed a new role in physics. And this was the answer that, I, that, that I'm presenting. And the answer is given by investigating a toy model, toy model case. Why this question became important recently? Because in, in this trend of new wave, Bruce and Dupli produced a four times four matrix quantum Hamiltonian, which possess a Z2, Z2 graded extension of the one dimensional super Poincare algebra. But the point is that this Hamiltonian that is written here, it is also an n equal to supersymmetry theory, supersymmetric quantum mechanics. By the way, as we pointed out in this paper, it is also n equal for supersymmetric quantum mechanics. So on one, side, on one sense, you can say, okay, the two, the two graded and supersymmetry describe the same kind of object. So it was yet unclear at this point, what is the relevance of the two, the two graded algebras and superalgebra. I should mention that uh, in these two papers that I, we, uh, I presented before, we provided the systematic constructions of classical models, word line sigma models in the Lagrangian setting based on this theory, and the fields are graded fields, graded parafermions, exotic bosons, they respect the grading. It's an extension of ordinary uh, graded version of word line superalgebra. And you can have a plethora of systems which satisfy this kind of property. In the following development, we also perform the canonical quantization of this system. So that you have some Hamiltonian, quantum Hamiltonians. In the simplest example, you can reproduce the Bruce Dupli Hamiltonian, but you can construct many other Hamiltonian also with the particle in interaction and so on and so on. And I stress that this kind of construction was not investigated before in this framework. And this is something that has to be done, had to be done. About connection of parastatistics, I mentioned the following. Basically, there are two approaches to parastatistics. One is based on the green trilinear relation. And in fact, there were some very relevant words by Palef and Ganchev in the 80s that pointed out that the green trilinear relation are uh, 
realized by graded Jacobi identities of certain Lie super algebra, especially the orthosymplectic ones. And in this context, uh, the two the two parastatistics uh, based on uh, the Rittenberg Weiler algebra were investigated by Young and Jing, followed by Tolstoy and Stolyev and Van der Jok. There exists another more flexible approach to parastatistics, which used, as I mentioned before, the formalism of Hopf algebra, graded Hopf algebra with braided tensor product that was introduced by, by Majid. And Kanakoglu and Daskaloyanis investigated the two, the two parastatistics in this of algebra contest. Uh, if you ask what is the relation between uh, uh, trilinear parastatistics paid by Green and Hopf algebra, there is very little that has been done. I can refer to paper. One is a paper by Aneva and Popov, and the other a work by Kanakoglu and Daskaloyanis. But not much, so far that I know, has been investigated on this. I use in this framework, as I mentioned before in my, in my presentation, the framework of Majid. And I will do something that uh, all these works here on parastatistics, they didn't address. Namely, the question if this system of paraparticles can be reproduced by ordinary particles or not. So this is the main topic of my, of my, of my talk. I can skip the interlude because this is a, I mean, this is a conference on, uh, where, on non commutativity So, and so I want, I have two interludes. One is the mathematical interlude about the two, the two graded the Lie algebra and super algebras. I want just to mention that uh, there is a way to unify the two graded algebras and the two, the two graded Lie algebras and super algebras by using basically the same kind of formalism. And you can do that introducing three types of grading, inner product, modulus two, uh, which are written here, case one, case two, and case three. The first one is the type of grading that you refer when you have ordinary the two graded super algebras. The second case with this uh, uh, anti-symmetric uh, product is applied to Lie algebra case Z to the two, and the third one is to the to the two graded uh, super algebras. And you can define the, the brackets. Brackets in this case means commutator or anti-commutator defined up to a sign, and the graded Jacobi identities, which are defined here. And you can use the same kind of formula for ordinary graded super algebras, but just the modification that the, this inner product is defined as I mentioned before. This is the first mathematical interlude. The second mathematical interlude is, uh, I want to just to mention very briefly the uh, construction of braided tensor associated with the graded Hopf algebra. And there is this, the simplest non trivial example of this is contained in the Majid book, chapter 10, when he proved that the, the, in the simplest example of grading, you can produce fermions that by flipping the sign, which means a Z2 grading. And of course, the Z2 Z2 grading, or better, I should say, the two type of Z2 Z2 grading are the next simplest example. In a braided tensor product, when you have a product of this type, uh, you have to flip this element C and the element B, and this generates some operator. You have to add some operator which encode this braiding property. And for the case that I'm working, this operator is just given by some sign which is consistent with the, the grading. So if you have some operator which is nilpotent. In the bosonic interpretation, you don't flip anything. So you get the coproduct of this squared is different from zero. But in the fermionic interpretation, due to the fact that you flip the sign, you get the zero. And this encodes the property that you have exclusion principle for fermions. 
The coproduct is important because uh, this is the basic uh, ingredient to construct from single particle to multiparticle uh, uh, multi particle state in quantum mechanics, uh, first quantization formalism. And since the coproduct satisfies co-associativity, you can go from one to two particle, to three particle, to n particle, and so on and so on. Okay, so this is the setup. Now, let me focus on the main result. And I can, main result is adding an extra bit of mystery to quantization. The pun, of course, is intended. And I refer to some review by Todorov, a nice review, which quantization is a mystery. The state of the art of, of all these problems that basing uh, with quantization. So, in chronological order, there are these three papers. Parafermion can be discriminated for ordinary fermions. A second paper with the genre, which appeared in Journal of Mathematical Physics, in which we introduce also the construction of the two, the two parabolons introduced from the Lie algebra, not the superalgebra. And the third one is that the, the gradings induce inequivalent multiparticle quantization. This is the last one in journal physics. In this talk, I reverse the chronological order and I start with these inequivalent quantization induced by different gradings. I use a toy model example, the simplest non trivial toy model example. I take this Hamiltonian, which is the. Five minutes left. Come on. You have five minutes left. Okay. So I take this four times four matrix Hamiltonian. I can prove that it is invariant under several type of algebra, the two the grady algebra and superalgebra. I have some matrix type raising operator, which are given here, which act on the vacuum. The vacuum is here. It is ordinary quantum mechanics. And I can associate, I can also some operators that are relevant later, there are some operators that exchange the different sector. These are in red, this X here. And I can give different gradings to this. I can say that some of these matrix operators are even, some of them are odd, some belong to some Z to Z to grading, and, and so far, so far. If I take the standard decomposition of matrices, which is block diagonal for even element, I get six possible gradings and the associated graded algebra that all abelian are given here. And this kind of algebra I introduce, I define as Hof algebra, the universal enveloping algebra, and I use the Medjit prescription. This gentleman, the Duke Gieres, uh, mentioned that there are also no standard grading that when you can have, when you, instead of having fermions in this block diagonal form, you arrange it this way. If you do things carefully, you ended up that you have six plus three non-standard grading, total nine grading that apply to this Hamiltonian. This theory is completely the same because this single particle Hamiltonian is the same. But when you apply to two particles, Hilbert space, you get this kind of table. So uh, the Hamiltonian is uh, four times four. These are give only the, the, the matrix type of vector. In two particles, I have 16 components of vector, which are given by this small letter, V1, V6. And this is the, are the type of vector entering under the construction for the different case. And you see that they are different. You see here. In some cases, you can explain this corresponds, for, for instance, this column that you have three matrix operators are all odd. So there are three vectors here that are absent because of exclusion principle. Because the uh, Majid framework encode automatically symmetric, anti-symmetric, or mixed symmetry uh, properties of, of, the, of the theory. So. The system is trivial because uh, the energy level are just the, uh, non, uh, the, the standard uh, uh, 0, 1, 2 uh, non-negative integer, but you can compute spot the difference by computing the, the generacy of this level. And you have this kind of table for all the nine cases. Now what happens? What happens is the following, that uh, some cases you can already discriminate just by looking at the degeneracy, but in some cases you cannot. 
For instance, in this case uh, where you have parabosons and bosons, you can see the same kind of number. So if you want to discriminate them, you need to find a way to do that. And how you do? In this way. You have to construct some observable that apply to both bosonic and parabosonic Hilbert space in this example. The observable should be Hermitian. And moreover, when applied to the, to the two graded setting, they should belong to the, the, to the zero zero graded sector. Why? Because you want the again values to be uh, real. So they should satisfy some uh, super selection rule. Once you have this, you can construct some operator based on this operator here, X with, with exchanging the sector. So these are acceptable operators that satisfy this condition. They apply to both these state, bosons and parabosons. And once you have do, you do that, you can rearrange the 10 vectors in the bosonic case and the 10 vectors in the para, parabosonic case in this way. And in three cases, the only difference can be encoded into a sign, epsilon. Epsilon plus one for bosons, epsilon for minus one for parabosons. What is the catch now? The catch is the following. That if you use this operator, you apply to the set of state, you get the again value. And if you see that one of the, the again values in at least some of the state depend on this epsilon, on this sign, this means that you can have theoretical possibility to discriminate bosons from parafermi. Parabosons from parabosons, parabosons from bosons. And you can do for three particles, you can do to discriminate fermions, uh, ordinary supersymmetry to the two, the two parafermionic, it works. In all these three cases, you have this kind of possibility to discriminate. It means that these nine gradings that exist for, in this specific example, for the single particle quantum Hamiltonian, that they cannot provide any difference in physics for the single particle quantum physics, they induce nine quantizations, which are inequivalent when you look at the multiparticle sector of the two. And this proves that indeed the two the two graded algebra sub and superalgebra give something that you cannot do with ordinary bosons and fermions. You cannot reconstruct with ordinary bosons and fermions. So this is my conclusion of the talk. Paraparticles recover from Rittenberg Weiler to be pieces. Okay, it is finished because this is the last one. Uh, once we have this, where we can find them? Either in fundamental physics, relativistic theory. We have to, uh, I give it assigned to a PhD student to revise the status of the spin statistics model. In laboratory physics as emergent structure, we have uh, in the paper with the Jana Kuznetsova, we have uh, some example of Hamiltonian, which looks similar to the Hamiltonian of quantum Hall effect that can be, can be done. Or we can also, when you have a structure to direct construct, for instance, you have a robotic metamaterial that you can make with Lego, you can manipulate qubit in order to produce uh, uh, this kind of structure. And okay, this is the end of my talk. And this is, uh, this is a list of references I can give, uh, I can pass to you. And, and that's it. Thanks for the attention and for having invited me here. Thanks, Francesco, for uh, the very nice talk. We have time for a couple of questions. Are there mm -hmm. uh, questions in, uh, here in Corfu? Um, I don't see any. Um, are there questions online? Okay, um, so there is a question by Laurent. Friday. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Hello, Francesco. Hello, Laurent. I cannot see you. Okay. Hello. Uh, I don't know why I turned my camera on. Sorry. Uh, I don't have that option. <coughs> I think it's up to the chair. Uh, <coughs> yeah, it's too bad you cannot see me. I will, uh, see, I will see you later. I will see you later because I know that you will speak later. Yeah. Uh, so. Uh, There is, there is an example of uh, Z2 times Z2 grading that appears in uh, recently, and maybe George will talk about it. So what we, what we showed is that if you look at the 
the, the states produced by a string, but when you allow all possible uh, uh, winding number in it, then you can prove that the- um, Sorry, can, can you repeat? The, can you repeat the, where is this example? It's, it's string theory. String theory, uh, yes. when, when you don't restrict uh, the spectra to be just, uh, you know, um, diagonal. So you include all the winding modes together. So it's string theory, which, which express T duality. In this, in this case, you can show that there is there is two sets of momenta, and depending on the parity of this momenta, they live on a on a lattice on a Lorentzian lattice, and depending on the scalar product of this momenta, you have a Z two times Z two grading, uh, which appears. So I would say that the Z two Z two grading is is the foundation of string theory. Um, you know, uh, well, th there was some application of that uh, in in the eighties by Jeltukin. Uh, there's some uh, some paper that. Was... As, yeah, far no, as, very, as I know, but I think this is very important because this yeah, no, it, it is, is very but, recent. But this is what this is the two that graded the super algebras with the admit uh, this mm -hmm. paraffin. No, it's just it's just it's coming from the momenta. It's tied up with the momenta, so it's a strange statistics. It's not a fixed statistics. So um, this is very. So we, we need to discuss because yeah, I'm very yeah. interested, of course, in these uh, all these possible applica applications. And this could be some uh, important uh, motivation, of course. For sure. So so yeah, it's related to the presence of co-cycles in vertex operators and the fact mm -hmm. that the target space becomes non-commutative, and then you have yes, the grading. So it's all tied up together. So maybe it would be nice if we yeah yeah sure. you have Perfect. a look at it. Um, Perfectly. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, thanks for uh, thanks, uh, thanks for sharing this uh, information, Laura. Okay. Oh, I, now I see you. <laughs> I cannot see me, but I see you. <laughs> okay. Um, are there uh, further questions? There is, there is one uh, more by the uh, Luther. If uh, you still have uh, your question. <clears throat> There is still, uh, uh, there are there more questions? Okay, if not, let's thank the speaker again. Thanks uh, to everybody. <laughs> and I hope next time <laughs> to see you personally. <laughs> Thanks uh, for uh, having Thanks, Francesco. Me. Okay, you can uh, stop sharing. Stop share, uh, and now uh, okay, the now speaker is uh, uh, Chris Omalis, uh, Chris Omalakos. Are you there? I'm trying to, um, I'm here. Okay, hi. Uh, so, okay, let me see. Come link. Okay. So, uh, start sharing your... okay, so uh, I start now then. Well, I'll take the opportunity to thank the organizers, uh, especially George Zupanos. We and, uh, your slide. Yes, I, I will put the slides in a moment. Uh, okay. Especially George Zupanos and uh, Kostas Anagnostopoulos uh, for inviting me and also for going through all the ordeal of uh, organizing this in a very demanding times. Okay, so... Uh, let me just share my screen now. Okay. Okay, can you see the screen? Nice. I see the, the screen, but uh, no slides, I think. Or at least it's okay. uh, empty. It will... Just a moment. Okay, so the title of my talk is uh, Entanglement in uh, Fuzzy R3. This is joint work with uh, Pedro Aguilar and myself here at the Institute of uh, Nuclear Sciences at UNAM in Mexico. 
Uh, it's part of the doctoral thesis of uh, Pedro, who has done most of the calculations. The starting point uh, will be area laws in general, and in particular the attempt by Srendnitsky to derive them from some uh, more basic uh, theory. Uh, then I will uh, talk about uh, a discretized version of these attempts, uh, first on the fuzzy sphere, and uh, finally on the fuzzy R3. I will explain what the, uh, uh, why we took this approach. So, uh, as I said, the starting point is uh, black hole entropy, which we know uh, is given by an area law. So the entropy is some uh, Planck scale by uh, the area of the black hole horizon. Now the, the arguments for uh, getting to this uh, result are uh, rather convoluted. Uh, I mean, there are tour de force of uh, intuition and hand waving, but uh, one would like to uh, be able to derive such results from uh, first principles. And uh, in that direction, uh, Srnedinsky uh, took a quantum field, massless quantum field, with the Hamiltonian uh, shown. And uh, the first step was to expand it in partial waves. So at each uh, radius r, you are supposed to integrate the field with uh, this ZLM, which are real uh, spherical harmonics. And uh, the result is uh, the partial wave uh, at that radius R. Note that uh, the choice of uh, modes, these partial waves, uh, dictates later the kind of slicing that you can do in your uh, space. So, VLM of R uh, is a degree of freedom that uh, is localized on a sphere of radius R. That's the important uh, part here. Okay, so uh, you can take the original Hamiltonian and uh, uh, substitute in it the field and the momentum in terms of uh, partial waves. And uh, you now have a Hamiltonian which is given by just the radial integral of uh, this expression. Next step is to somehow uh, try to regularize this. And you need two uh, cutoffs, one uh, ultraviolet, another one uh, infrared. Uh, the ultraviolet comes from uh, discretization of the radial uh, variable in steps of this uh, parameter A, which is the ultraviolet cutoff. And the infrared comes from uh, assuming that the field is zero beyond a certain maximal radius, in this case, J max times A. So when this is done, the Hamiltonian, which before was an integral over the radial direction, now becomes a sum first over the partial waves and then over uh, discrete points along the radial direction. And the quantities uh, phi lm comma j that you see here and p lm comma j are just the values of the original partial waves at these discrete points. Note that uh, uh, these quantities are conjugate variables uh, as operators. With this uh, Hamiltonian, uh, it is of the general form uh, shown here, so it's just uh, coupled the harmonic oscillators, uh, coupled by this matrix uh, K. So, uh, it is also a sum of our LM, so it factorizes into uh, this way, and uh, the particular wave function PsiLM of the uh, amplitudes is given by uh, Gaussian. Well, one first has to uh, diagonalize this k and then uh, go back to the original basis. So uh, the total wave, ground state wave function is a product of Gaussians like the one uh, you see here. What uh, Srednitsky did afterwards was to take this 
total space, the, the spherical region where the field has support. And imagine a smaller sphere concentric with uh, the bigger one, which divides the degrees of freedom, uh, this amplitudes phi lm j, into interior ones and exterior ones. Notice that uh, uh, this is dictated, this division is dictated by the uh, support these uh, uh, modes have. Okay, so these modes have support on a spherical shell. So uh, if you want a clean division that cleanly uh, divides the degrees of freedom into interior and exterior, you are forced more or less to adopt this uh, spherical divide here. So having divided the degrees of freedom in uh, two subsets, then the ground state can be considered a bipartite uh, state. And uh, one may ask uh, how much uh, uh, entanglement is there in the ground state with uh, this division. And uh, the procedure is standard, so you, you write down the, the density matrix for the ground state, uh, then you trace over the internal degrees of freedom, you're left with um, the reduced density matrix for the outside degrees of freedom, and then you have to find the eigenvalues of that and compute the corresponding Shannon entropy for those eigenvalues. And it can only be done, of course, because we're nice and Gaussian here, everything is quadratic. So, uh, Stranditsky did the calculation, and uh, that's the beautiful result. On the vertical axis, that's taken directly from his article, the, the graph. So, on the vertical axis, you have the entanglement entropy between interior and exterior um, regions of the sphere. And on the horizontal, you have the area, well, you have R square, where R is the uh, radius of the, uh, of the sphere that divides the two regions. And there is this beautiful fit by a straight line um, with a coefficient that is the inverse of the ultraviolet cutoff. So if you compare this with the black hole entropy, this tells you that this uh, ultraviolet cutoff is of the order of uh, Planck scale. So this all looks uh, beautiful and then the question is, uh, does it look too beautiful? What I mean by this, uh, okay, that's an impressive uh, fit, uh, but uh, how general this result is, under what assumptions can we expect such uh, linearity, and uh, how much does this uh, depend on the particular uh, choices made? So that's the general uh, line of work we uh, would like to uh, undertake. Now, an important part uh, in uh, the treatment here is, of course, uh, regularization, uh, which in the case of the calculation I presented is done by hand. Uh, we just uh, discretize uh, in uh, equal steps the radial direction. On the other hand, uh, we know that working with uh, non-commutative uh, field theory, there is uh, some uh, built-in discretization of uh, space. So it's very tempting to try to repeat uh, this calculation in a non-commutative context and see how much of it survives, uh, whether this linearity persists in the non-commutative uh, context. And, uh, well, experiment a little bit uh, since we now have a discrete system. So uh, the first step is to uh, put a field on the fuzzy sphere uh, there is uh, several uh, works uh, in that direction. I will follow mostly the third one that appears here. And uh, to that end, one introduces uh, quantized coordinates on a sphere which is embedded in uh, R3. So we have these three uh, XAs, which are essentially uh, proportional to the spin j representation of uh, SU2. So the L's uh, satisfy exact uh, SU2 algebra, the X's satisfy uh, an algebra with uh, rescaling of the structure constant. So uh, the field that lives on uh, the sphere, on this diffuse sphere, is just a function of the coordinates. So it is itself a Hermitian matrix. 
Now, just like in the case of the previous calculation, it is important to first identify the degrees of freedom and second, uh, be able to point on the sphere where do these degrees of freedom uh, lie. So, uh, to localize them in some sense. Okay, uh, to that end, it's uh, convenient uh, to each uh, uh, configuration of the field given by this Hermitian matrix uh, phi, we can uh, compute its expectation value in a spin J uh, coherent state. And this gives us uh, a function on the sphere, which is called the symbol of the uh, operator of the, of the field. And this can be expanded, of course, uh, where, uh, in this sum, where phi mn are just the entries of phi, and therefore the function that uh, multiplies phi mn here is just the symbol of uh, this matrix here, which uh, has all zeros except uh, a single uh, unit entry at position mn. So these are the basic functions, the basic symbols, and then the symbol of any other uh, operator is just a linear combination of, uh, of these. These functions, uh, they're defined on the sphere and uh, their support gives us an idea of the localization of uh, the corresponding degree of freedom. Now, uh, the authors of that work uh, consider the Lagrangian of a massive uh, free field uh, I will not go into the details of uh, the particular form, but it's well, it's more or less uh, standard. And uh, well, they uh, name the components of the uh, field in this particular way. So there is this second diagonal ordering of the components, taking into account the hermeticity. And in terms of those, uh, the Hamiltonian takes uh, this form, it's a finite sum, over components and their dual momenta. And now uh, the division is done uh, by uh, a circle at an angle of theta, which uh, defines this spherical cup as one region and so the rest of the sphere as the second one. And of course, again, this uh, division is dictated by the fact that uh, the uh, degrees of freedom, which are the entries of that matrix, they have support on a ring uh, of constant theta. So again, uh, the division uh, is chosen so that uh, the degrees of freedom are cleanly uh, divided into interior and exterior ones. Uh, it can be shown then uh, with this uh, identification that uh, the degrees of freedom uh, which are localized in the spherical cup correspond to field configurations that have uh, uh, entries in this uh, triangular uh, region of the matrix. The rest is uh, very similar. Uh, the ground state is computed because we're still dealing with uh, a quadratic uh, expression here. Uh, and then uh, the degrees of freedom inside the spherical cup are traced uh, out and the uh, Shannon entropy of the eigenvalues of the resulting um, reduced density matrix is computed. And uh, when the dust settles, there is uh, a graph of entanglement entropy on the vertical axis here and uh, angle theta of the spherical cup on the uh, horizontal axis. And this, of course, this curve uh, reminds an inverted cosine, so it's something like 1 minus cosine, and 1 minus cosine theta is the area of the spherical cup. It is not the circumference of its uh, boundary. So, in this case, uh, what is recovered is clearly a volume law rather than an area law. So one wonders now, um, what happened to that beautiful uh, straight line of uh, uh, Stranitsky? Uh, why did it become a uh, volume law now? Okay, but then we can continue uh, adding one more dimension in the problem. 
So uh, we now look at uh, field theory on non-commutative uh, R3. I'm uh, following here uh, this reference among the many that exist on the subject. So the way to uh, get to uh, some version of non-commutative R3, which I say from the beginning that uh, in the commutative limit is not uh, exactly our uh, Euclidean R3 that we know of, but it is still useful as a toy model. So one starts with two copies of uh, the non-commutative plane, uh, R theta. Uh, this is a plane with uh, coordinates x1, x2, which satisfy this commutation relation. Note that uh, this reminds uh, more uh, a phase space, uh, two-dimensional phase space. So x1 is a position and x2 is the conjugate momentum. And we have two such uh, planes uh, indexed by this alpha. So it's a sort of uh, four-dimensional space. Uh, because of the similarity of these commutation relations with uh, the canonical ones between X and P, it is uh, tempting to de define this uh, raising and lowering operators which satisfy canonical commutation relations, the corresponding uh, number operators, and then following uh, Vic, uh, Swinger, we define uh, these coordinates QA, which are bilinear in the raising and lowering operators uh, using the Pauli sigma matrices. And of course, uh, these Qs uh, then are bound to satisfy the same algebra as the Pauli matrices up to this uh, rescale in lambda. So these are our spatial uh, coordinates. It's a three-dimensional space that's R3, and they do not commute, that's the non-commutative uh, parts. This Q0, uh, which is defined to be a number operator, is related to the radial coordinate. And uh, the states these operators act on are produced by the vacuum uh, by application in the standard way of uh, uh, raising operators. Uh, these states are just two-dimensional harmonic oscillator states. Okay, and uh, we know that uh, the raising and lowering operators uh, in a Schwinger uh, model they mix only the harmonic oscillator states which are within these uh, regions marked in red here. So. Uh, they act irreducibly only within uh, these blocks. Accordingly, the uh, quantum coordinates QA, they acquire this block form. Okay, and the block uh, of uh, spin K uh, is a 2K plus 1 sized uh, rectangular matrix and can be thought of as quantized coordinate on a sphere of radius uh, given by this expression here. Okay, now uh, the state of uh, spin K and uh, projection M is given by this expression uh, of operators, raising operators uh, acting on the vacuum. Uh, the field is again uh, uh, a function of the Qs of the quantized coordinates, so uh, it retains this uh, block diagonal form. It can be written as a sum over all these blocks. And then each block can be expanded in uh, uh, these particular uh, elementary uh, operators. And the coefficients of this expansion are the degrees of freedom of the field. Now, the Hamiltonian in terms of these degrees of freedom is written in the Why following uh, form. No, I have nine minutes if it's 30. Uh, okay, so uh, that's the Hamiltonian. Um, it has a diagonal part, the first line, and then the interesting part is the next two lines where a degree of freedom at radius j is coupled to a degree of freedom at radius j plus one half. So that's the next sphere in this series of concentric spheres. Uh, that's a, that's a uh, sketch of uh, the particular degrees of freedom that uh, this Hamiltonian uh, connects. So the lines correspond to terms connected to uh, among themselves by the Hamiltonian. 
Now, uh, again, the elementary operator uh, of spin J with a single entry at MN has support in a ring at an angle theta given by this arc cosine. So again, this uh, uh, dictates what kind of division we can do. <clears throat> uh, this is, again, a more complicated graph of uh, all the terms connected by uh, the uh, Hamiltonian, the z-axis is in uh, horizontally and uh, this figure is uh, supposed to be rotated around the z-axis to generate uh, the image of the sphere. Now, uh, first one needs to uh, translate this operator, which is this block diagonal matrix, into a long uh, vector infinite dimensional column vector and we do it in the way uh, sketched here so we start with the smallest spin block and go down and then within each block we follow this red line so we put all the entries one after another and uh, we assign an index of a particular entry which in terms of its j m n uh, coordinates it's given by this expression the number of degrees of freedom is uh, given by uh, this function of the script j which is the maximal uh, spin we allow so we truncate this infinite uh, matrix up to some maximal uh, j which i denote here by script j now the hamiltonian again is uh, uh, diagonalizable uh, easily uh, being uh, quadratic so I will uh, skip a little bit uh, the details, which are absolutely standard, of course. And uh, then the question is, how do we slice now this three-dimensional space? The first option is to uh, do uh, the standard slicing, which is by some concentric sphere. So uh, interior and exterior regions, we compute uh, with uh, more or less standard techniques uh, uh, entanglement entropy. Uh, I will skip uh, the... Uh, standard the techniques here and i will go directly to a plot of the entanglement entropy which depends on the radius of the sphere that divides the two regions and the mass of the particle so on this axis you have radius and on this one you have uh, mass on the vertical you have entanglement entropy of course as you reach the outer wall uh, entanglement entropy drops to zero and of course we do not expect an area law uh, that close to the uh, outer wall but uh, for uh, regions a bit further from the outer wall uh, we do get a power uh, law only it is not strict uh, square so uh, for different values of the mass we have uh, made a fit uh, as you can see, the fit is rather good, and it is of the form just uh, a coefficient, an overall coefficient times radius to some power. Both the coefficient and the power depend on the mass. So for a fixed mass, we have a power law which, uh, with an exponent going from 1.8 up to 3.2, uh, depending on the mass. Now, uh, the not so easy choice now is to slice the sphere by a horizontal plane uh, this does not conform nicely to the localization properties of uh, the uh, modes but it can still be uh, done although with considerably more uh, work and uh, in that case uh, we find that uh, the division of degrees of freedom those that are above the plane and those that are below the plane is much more complicated it's given by this uh, multiple conditions uh, which well the computer will handle will divide the degrees of freedom in two sets and that's uh, the final plot where again we plot uh, entanglement entropy versus uh, now this time the horizontal axis here is area of the disk that divides the two uh, parts of the sphere and the other axis is still the mass. And as you can see, there is nothing linear about uh, this relation. So uh, to conclude, uh, my question to the experts is, uh, what exactly uh, are these area laws uh, uh, supposed to be? And what is a proper formulation of entanglement area laws? Thank you. Thanks for the nice talk. Are there questions? Uh, 
So in Corfo, is he known, but there is uh, uh, one by Laurent. Hello, uh, just very nice talk. Just a question, what's the value you get for uh, massless sectors? Because the area law is supposed to really appear in gravity, right? Not, uh, not in general theory. So what's the value you get there? Uh, the value of, uh, of what? The value of the exponent for massless particles. Because this is okay. really then you refer to the division by uh, a sphere because yeah. there uh, yeah. we have the okay. Uh, let me uh, go back here. Uh, it is here, there, and uh, it's one point eight four. Okay. Okay, so it's close to an area law, but uh, not exactly. Nothing like uh, Srednitsky's perfect straight line, though. And you understand and, why it's not? What's no. the difference? Uh, so uh, my my question is: uh, I mean, when should we expect it? Uh, an area law? Uh, does it depend on discretization? Does it depend on how I slice things? Because uh, there we chose uh, explicitly an ugly slicing, but uh, still manageable, although uh, much much harder than the spherical one. But it can be done, and uh, then. Uh, the uh, area law goes uh, completely out of the window. So uh, how robust is this result? I mean, it's so uh, so uh, charming when you see uh, the straight line of uh, Snedecki, but then you do something else which is not uh, so canonical and it just goes completely away. So uh, how do we understand this? What's the intuition behind this? When should we expect an area law? When should we expect something different? Uh, how does it relate to the slicing? How does it relate to the choice of uh, uh, degrees of freedom, etc., etc., etc.? So yeah, uh, it's are, just uh, these are all very good question. I would say that the key is that the the source of discretization should be gravity and the symmetry is behind gravity, right? So ultimately, it should not be up to us. But you're okay. right. You know, it but doesn't then, mean that. Uh, Okay, but then one should come out and uh, say what you just said in some, uh, you know, nice clean uh, form and uh, uh, give us a definition or uh, some uh, guideline. Uh, what are the area laws, uh, uh, what they should look like and under what circumstances. Okay, so we are not experts in this. We just uh, are outside looking inside and wanted to see how this works and how robust it is, especially that. And it does not look at all uh, robust. So. Uh, some better understanding of this uh, uh, concept is needed. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, that's good. Thank you. Sure, thanks. Are there more questions? Okay, seeing none, then uh, let's thank uh, again uh, Chris Malis for his nice talk. Thank you. And now we have the coffee break and we start again in 30 minutes. That means at 5.30 p.m. Corfu time. Okay.